morning, Redwood family. So good to see everybody. I hope you had a great fourth yesterday. It doesn't look like we see any singed eyebrows or a burnt hair. I had my own close call last night, but uh, you know, I've never heard or seen so many fireworks in town. I think it was uh, maybe because they canceled the big fireworks. So then, you know, the common man feels empowered to blow up his own neighborhood. So, um, but really, you know, um, good times and I hope you had a good fourth. And again, we're having a barbecue after the service to hang out and to celebrate uh, Karina and and my marriage. And so thank you for those of you who want to stick around. You're all welcome and invited to that. I know it's dangerous to have a sermon when they're grilling burgers behind me. Uh, So we'll, maybe it'll make it shorter, you know, Uh, but we can hope. Um, But really, we've got lots to be thankful for and lots to pray for. So let's do that right now and quiet our hearts for a moment of of thankfulness and uh, request. Father, we're thankful to be outside in this uh, beautiful location when many facilities right now are indoors uh, having to wear masks. We're thankful to be out here and uh, with one another. We're thankful to live in this country, this imperfect country, but a country that that is great and has uh, afforded us so many opportunities. Thank you for our freedom to to meet. Lord, we're reminded of Anna Grace today, who's in the hospital in Medford with a fever, and her immune system is so compromised, so we just pray for healing in her life, God. Raise her up. We pray for our brother Rick Major. We pray that you'd raise him up as well and bring healing to his body. Lord, for my friend Cole Cummyford who uh, cut off his thumb and uh, it's uh, being re- restored. We pray for circulation to be restored to his thumb, Lord, and uh, that you would lift him up as well. Lord, and so many people uh, with, with medical issues and problems, we remember them today and we bring to mind those who uh, I didn't mention. And Lord, now as we dive into your word, uh, would you speak to us this morning? Uh, we want to hear from you, not from Tyler, uh, not from... Um, human philosophy, Lord, but from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, have you ever noticed that in some situations, hard work doesn't always work? Sometimes more struggle is less helpful, like a car stuck in the mud. The more you push on the gas, the more stuck you get. Or maybe you're in an argument with someone that you love. Have you ever noticed that the harder we fight to win the more we actually lose, the bigger hole we dig for ourselves. On an unrelated note, I've been married about a month and I'm learning a lot. (laughs) Or how about friendships? I know all friendships take some level of commitment, but aren't our best friends usually the least amount of work? Right? I mean, they're easy to be with. They're not needy or demanding. Uh, We don't have to work to impress them or make them like us. But if I have to work super hard in a friendship, uh, it's probably not a healthy one. So when we're spinning our wheels or digging holes in life, it's always helpful to step back and ask, am I doing this right? Uh, Is my passion aimed in the right direction? Am I aiming at the right things in the right ways? The whole work smarter, not harder, right? Well, today in Romans 10... Paul's going to show us that the people of Israel tragically did not learn this lesson in their relationship with God. So as a church, we've been studying Paul's letter to the Romans, and Paul writes this letter to probably 150 Christians in the massive city of Rome meeting in house churches. So I didn't count you guys, but there's probably more of us here than there were Christians in the entire city of Rome, just to give us some perspective, a city of maybe half a million to a million people. And these these Christians are both Jews and Gentiles, worshiping Jesus under the same uh, roofs, uh, Christians. But their diversity causes quite a bit of tension. We've talked about this, right? Specifically, the Jewish Christians are the minority in these house churches. And so in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is working through a major problem, one that's very personal to him. This is a problem that's kept him up late many nights, and the Jewish Christians in Rome as well. And here's the problem. Why are more Jews not becoming Christians? Why are there not more Jewish Christians? Everywhere Paul goes, from his hometown to no town, Timbuktu, everywhere he goes, he'll go to the synagogue, talk about Jesus. Some Jews are interested, 
but most are irritated. So for example, one example of many, Acts 13, 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Awesome. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. So we see this all over the New Testament a constant hostility by the Jewish community towards the Jewish Christians like Paul. And so the Jewish Christians start to wonder if God is failing in his promises made in the Old Testament to Israel. Promises like Jeremiah 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel. No longer will they teach their neighbor, say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And it doesn't seem like this is happening. But Paul gives two reasons for this. He's thought a lot about this. And in chapter 9, the reason was election. God's selection of a smaller group in Israel and not the entire country. God simply makes choices that we can't completely understand. Just as God chose Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, uh, God has chosen the Gentiles by and large over Israel, at least for now. But Paul's second reason for this in Romans 10 is focused more on Israel's own disobedience. So God makes choices, but so do humans. And we're responsible for our own choices. To use the biblical language, God hardens hearts, but we harden our own hearts as well. And Israel has a hard heart, remaining cold, indifferent, or hostile to the Jewish Jesus. So today we're going to talk about three things. The failure of Israel the simplicity of the message, and the necessity of mission. Failure of Israel, simplicity of the message, and the necessity of mission. So let's dive in. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans 9.30, and it'll be on the screen as well if you can see that. I chose the New Living Translation today because I didn't understand the other translations. I did my best, but uh, these, are hard, these are hard chapters, guys. I'm ready for Proverbs in a couple weeks. Romans 9.30. What does all this mean? For even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law, instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is a misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, All who believe in him are made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. So we see the failure of Israel. Paul begins and ends chapter 10 with this theme. So we'll finish uh, chapter 10 in uh, verse 16. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who's believed our message? So faith comes from hearing that is hearing the good news about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message has gone throughout all the earth, the words to all the world. But I ask, do the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, God said, I will arouse your jealousy through the people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. And later Isaiah spoke boldly of God saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long, I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebellious. If you're taking notes in our church app, the first thing we notice is Israel's failure of ignorance. Romans 10, 2, they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Verse 3, since they did not know about the righteousness of God. Now, isn't this odd? The Jewish people who knew the most about God knew the least about relationship with God. The Gentile people who knew the least about God came to know God best. Israel remained ignorant, 
sometimes willfully ignorant, like when I pretend not to see the speed limit sign. This isn't just a Jewish problem. Jesus and Paul, all over the Bible, use the image of blindness for those who are not in relationship with God, not in relationship with Jesus. Jesus says his whole purpose is to show those who think they see that they're blind. And one of the first steps in spiritual recovery is recognizing our own spiritual blindness, our own um, lack of discernment when it comes to the things of God. Jesus says in Luke 12, 56, you fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs of earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. And like so many in Israel, many of us can remain willfully ignorant, not interested or invested in the things of God. So this failure of ignorance for Israel led to a failure of zeal. Verse two says they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Zeal without knowledge. We never see that today, right? I was watching uh, on, on TV or it was on a Facebook video or something. Someone was tearing down a statue like some people are doing and uh, they interviewed him and he didn't know who the person was for, of the statue they were tearing down. I think it was Grant or something. Or a social media mob that jumps all over somebody without having the whole facts. Uh, zeal without knowledge. Verse three, refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. Israel tried so hard to get right with God, but they failed. The Gentiles, like many of us, didn't really try at all and succeeded. The hardest working were the least successful. How can this be? Well, we might notice this in something today, like when we maybe compare good people and bad people, good people and bad people. Uh, the bad person might have sinned a lot, done a lot of bad things, but this often humbles them and, uh, and makes them more dependent on God. But the good person, the moral person, the church kid like me, often is less aware of my flaws, uh, less aware of my issues, right? maybe harboring a sense of superiority over others. Worse, worse still, we can grow to think that God owes us. I've done all this for God, now he should do this for me. I deserve this. Israel works super hard, but in the wrong way, with the wrong mentality. And Paul uses the image of a foot race, uh, running, to describe Israel's failure. They're running a lot, but pointlessly, aimlessly. It makes me think of Zach Bitter. You might have heard of this guy. Uh, a few weeks ago, professional runner Zach Bitter broke the world's 100-mile treadmill record. So you heard me right. 100 miles, treadmill, record. <laughs> What'd you do on quarantine, you know? <clears throat> so his, his record was about 12 hours. His pace was something like 7.15 per mile for 100 miles straight, right? And I, I think Paul might appreciate the treadmill image if he were around today. It's pointless movement. Israel worked so hard, they cranked out the miles on this spiritual treadmill, trying to get right with God, trying to be righteous in their own strength. But on this spiritual treadmill, they haven't gone anywhere. They're staying in the same place, like hamsters on a spinning wheel. It's like Francis Chan once said, I'm less worried about failure and more worried about succeeding at the things that don't really matter. I'm less worried about failure, less concerned about failure, and more concerned about succeeding at that which doesn't really matter. What if I'm super successful at something that's not that important? So Israel had a misdirected zeal, trying to get right with God through Old Testament laws and, and prideful self-identity, which led to a failure of trust, if you're taking notes. Romans 10, 3, they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own. Romans 9, 32, they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. So Paul quotes the, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah and uses the image of a stumbling stone, a rock. 
And it's a, mi- a mixed metaphor. It represents Jesus in, in one of two ways. He's either the firm foundation or the stumbling stone. So he's either the, the person we build our life on or the inconveniently placed uh, thing in, in our path that we trip over. Many of us have tripped on roots while ru- uh, walking or running, uh, run into poles, <laughs> uh, or, uh, run into deer with our car, uh, or maybe that's just me, but <laughs> Israel really stumbles over the Jesus message, a massive roadblock in their thinking. And for example, Israel found the idea of a crucified king scandalous. 1 Corinthians 1.23, so when we preach that Christ was crucified, Paul says, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Then the idea of God becoming a man, scandalous. I sat by a Jewish rabbi one time on an airplane and this was his big problem with Christianity, that God could become a man. And I'm like, I get it, it's kind of weird. The idea of salvation by grace through faith alone, that where I come from, what I've done, my DNA, it doesn't matter at all. Only faith, scandalous. And these roadblocks, these stumbling stones meant that for most Jews, they said no thanks to Jesus the King. They don't trust Jesus for salvation. They continue doing it on their own and thus tragically continue on the treadmill. Well, in contrast to the failure of Israel is the simplicity of Paul's gospel message. And uh, this part of chapter 10 has meant a great deal to me uh, in my life. Romans 10, verse 6. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. And don't say who will go back to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It's on your lips and in your heart. That message is the very message about faith we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It's by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. As scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a great text, isn't it? We could end and go home. But I don't think the burgers are done yet, you know? I find this message simple in at least three ways. First, simple access. Paul relies heavily on Deuteronomy 30 here. Paul and Moses use this fictional character who asks two questions. Questions humans have been asking for thousands of years. And so the first question that the guy asks, who will... uh, Pretty much, uh, who will ascend to heaven for us? Or in other words, uh, who can climb into heaven and give us divine instruction? Who will uh, climb into heaven and find us an expert, a teacher, a guru, a trainer, a life coach, YouTuber, a celebrity, a politician to, to proclaim the path to us? Who can go to heaven and bring us down some wisdom? And Paul answers, no need. We don't need that. Christ has already come down from heaven to us. Then the questioner asks, who will descend into the abyss? In other words, who will explore the dark places that most of us don't want to explore? Uh, Who will uh, do the necessary digging to unearth what we need to know and understand? And Paul answers again, no need for someone to dig or descend Christ has already been there in the place of the dead and rose again for us. So we don't need to search far and wide. We don't need to go to heaven or hell for information because Christ has already been to both places for us and brought the message to us. Paul tells the Athenian philosophers that God is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and exist. God is near. He's not far from any of us. He, he's near. His message is close too. It's accessible. It's like, it's like a next door neighbor who's always inviting you over for barbecues and drinks. Constantly, uh, the, the door's always open. The invitation is always valid. God's message is like that as long as we're breathing. 
Well, not only is the message accessible, but its directives are very simple. I like simple directions. I just got a new desk from Crate and Barrel. This replaced the old desk that my wife made me sell. You guys remember that thing? Big desk, yep, it's, it's gone. Someone in Medford bought it. But uh, So this new desk, it was smaller, it's pretty cool though, it's sleek. And uh, assembly was very easy. It came with screws, the Allen wrench ones, you know, idiot proof. Um, it, it uh, you know, the instructions, like there's big parts that fit together like Legos. Uh, instructions with big pictures, big arrows, and small words. My kind of project. So this thing, I made it really quickly. And uh, I love simple directions. And the message of Jesus is not complicated. It's very simple. Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Very clear, isn't it? Confess and believe. What do we confess and believe? Because these aren't magic words. Uh, this is an acknowledgement of trust and surrender. We confess and believe in two things, Jesus' work and his person, his person and his work. So his person, Paul says, we confess Jesus is Lord, uh, King, ruler, master, God, um, not just savior, not just get out of hell free card or homeboy or friend or buddy, but King, Jesus as the ultimate authority. And we confess and believe in his work. It says that God raised him from the dead. So that implies that he died and rose again for us. Romans 4, 4, now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believe on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. So there's no work required for this gift. No work required. Uh, no need to be 60 days clean from whatever your sin struggle is. And we all have them. It's never been about my ability or my streak or my record or resume. It's about my heart and simply trusting in Jesus. And he does the hard work of renovation as we trust in him. Well, finally, this message provides a simple assurance. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, when I doubt whether or not I'm saved, this is usually the first uh, verse I go to. When I doubt whether or not I'm one of God's children, I go to this one. And I say it repeatedly. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone say everyone. Everyone. That includes me. That includes you if you've called on his name. Well, the failure of Israel and the simplicity of the message drives Paul to mission. It's as if he says, man, I'm so excited about this. I have to share it with everybody. I cannot contain it. And so some people might think that because salvation isn't by works, that we don't have to work. But that's not going to work. It's not going to work. So this starts, as all things should, with the need to pray. Verse 1, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Paul loved, loves these people. And remember, many of them are trying to kill him. But he loves them. He wants them saved. And, and how does that happen? How does his heart change and transform in that way? It's because he's praying for them. Prayer will soften our hearts, reshape our desires, give us God's perspective on people, and prepare us for conversations that we don't even know might be happening today. And it prepares other people to hear. I prayed for you this morning. Many of you prayed for me this morning. Thank you. I need it. Lots of it. Karina needs more of it because <laughs> she's married to me, right? So we don't just pray, but we also see the need to speak. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. So being a good example is important, but it's not enough. People have to hear the message that God loves them and Jesus died for them. Jesus is king. Faith comes from hearing, hearing, whether it be here at church. Have you ever wondered why does, why do we always read from this book and Tyler says the same sorts of things and it's just the same thing every week because faith comes through hearing. 
That could be here at church. That could be on your lunch break in conversations with people. That could be with your kids way after bedtime. I've heard that's the, those are the best questions, right? Way after their bedtime, they're asking those kinds of deep existential questions about the meaning of life. Faith comes from hearing. And with, with those maybe who don't believe, we ask questions. We create God space for natural spiritual conversations. And with permission, we share what Jesus has done for us. So we need to pray. We need to speak. And finally, the need to send and go. At verse 14, this will cap off the scripture here. Verse 14 says, How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. And I'm thankful for so many of you who help send me and send our pastors to this community and who send missionaries all around the world. But we don't only send. We're all required to go, to be the beautiful message carriers. But our attraction comes not from us, but from the message that we're carrying. The, the good news. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is king. He's changed my life, and I think he can change yours. And again, back to the hard work thing, I don't think hard work is the right way to think about mission. Sure, there are times where it's difficult or uncomfortable to talk about the deeper things, but maybe if we're more natural about it, more openly Christian but less weird, uh, more simple and authentic in our experience, people might find the message more compelling. Prayer, speak, send. I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and we're going to sing a, a brief two more songs. But Romans 10.4 basically says that Christ is the finish line. How many of you have run a 5K before? Walked a 5K? You know, uh, a few of you? Good. Maybe we got to do our church 5K again, huh? Uh, Dr. Hammond, you can run it. That'd be great once things open up a little bit. Um, 5Ks. One of the best parts of the 5K is when you're done. The relief of being finished. Because there's snacks. There's awards, there's the ambulance if you need it, the paramedics. But at the end of the day, the best part is when you get to stop running. And it, and it's, it was the same for us getting married too. It was like a massive finish line. Uh, you know, and in some ways it's a uh, starting line too. But, um, you know, there was such a relief after the grueling season of waiting and planning. And I'm super excited to celebrate with you guys who are sticking around after uh, and just to hang out and, and talk for a little bit um, to, to celebrate this finish line for us. And in the same way, in a similar way, Christ provides the relief of completion. In his dying breath, he utters the, the, the famous, it is finished. He is the finish line. All our strivings cease. We can stop running we can rest in him and we get to joyfully announce to those around us that they can stop running too. Stop stressing and striving and straining and trying and simply receive Jesus by trusting in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. I thank you for the simple, simple gospel message that if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and believe in our hearts that you were raised from the dead, we will be saved. That's the message that's so important to so many of us, God. And if there are those of us here who have not received that message, Lord, would you soften hearts and soften our hearts to uh, be more uh, open about it. Lord, and it's also on my heart to pray for the people of Israel. So few of them have trusted in you. So few of them know and love you. So Lord, I pray for many, many hearts of, uh, of Jewish people to turn back to you. The, the true Savior, the true Jewish Messiah. Lord, thanks for all that you're doing. Uh, we think of the people who weren't able to be here today. Uh, remind them of your peace and comfort in this time. In Jesus' name.